welcome everyone my name is Anne Murray Brown and I will be facilitating the session today and I'm joined by my co-host Zhao is Zhao who is assisting me today but also I have panelists who are here to share their knowledge and their expertise in this conversation we'll be here together for a little under an hour and the first person identifies as a woman. She's a queer woman from South India, and she heads the proudly queer, feminist, and anti-racist Boutique Consultancy. Restorative justice is a pivotal element in her work, rooted in a strong foundation of social and gender politics. She is Sunyukta Murti. Welcome. Okay. And also, Hi, everyone. We, we also have another person who identifies as a woman. He's Indonesian, and she's the leader of the impact team at Results in Health. She's a specialist in participatory monitoring and evaluation techniques, such as most significant change. And she has used this methodology in many projects globally. She is Noor Hediati. Welcome. Thanks, Anne. Hi, everyone. And last, but definitely not least, is a man who is Dutch, and he is the Senior Global Partnership Advisor at Wagner University and Research Center Development for Innovation. He places a strong emphasis on facilitating knowledge exchange between diverse regions of the world and fostering the co-creation of global knowledge ecosystems. He is Aryan Kulslav. Hello, everybody. Thanks. All right. Welcome. So to kick us off, I would like to share an image with you, right? But before that, the process for today is we'll have around 30 minutes of conversation with panelists. And the last 30 minutes where you can post questions and have them answered. And mm -hmm. we will end with a short video. So, but before the question and answer segment, if you have any thoughts or comments or questions, you can also put them in the chat. And Zhao will be keeping an eye on the chat. And if anything comes up, he will flag my attention and we can address it. So that is how we'll proceed today. But to kick us off, I am sharing an image shortly on my screen. And write a few lines, one sentence or two sentences in the chat. The first thing that pops up in your mind when you look at this image. Now you are to write it in the chat, but do not press send. Do not click send until I ask you to click send. So here we go. Here the image comes. All being well, you should be able to see the image. When you look on this image, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? What emotions, what thoughts? Two sentences in the chat, but do not send. All right, I think we have enough time now to maybe write in the chat our thoughts. Now I ask you, Click send. <laughs> All right. I'm reading colonization, white person as a giver, black person as receiver, white showing of support, disappointment every time I see Boris Johnson, ah, English ah, aid, <laughs> commercial for the UK and UNICEF. Idiot. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Some of these things I can't read. Colonial humanitarian aid, unequal, white severitism, and the list goes on. So I open the floor to my panelists. Do any of these sentiments resonate with you? When you saw this image, what were your thoughts? Ladies first. <laughs> okay, my I thoughts were exactly. With, oh, go for it. Sanyuk, I want you you want to start? Okay, just a very quick. I think I resonate with what uh, people put in the chat. I almost exactly wrote exactly the same. It's a uh, colonial aid. It's it's 
before maybe it was okay, it was accepted, but it should not happen today. So that's my thought. Yeah, I wrote. Uh, I think a lot of the people dialing in from the UK. Um, I lived there, so I had. The, I wrote the same thing. A white hot rage, looking at Boris Johnson trying to do anything decent in his life. Um, yeah. Maybe on a bit more positive note, maybe good intentions, but not uh, contextualized, and therefore not bringing any results. Well, thank you for that feedback. And I would ask you, though, this is for any member of the panel. And thank you, Aryan, for a <laughs> positive note. But is it so bad, this aid? Because he has a box of aid bringing, hopefully, to persons who need it. So is colonialism or is, this, is it all bad? What else positive can we say about this? Um, in terms of uh, monitoring and evaluation, the topic of today, I do think that aid, as it has been delivered, maybe we can learn a bit from it in terms of uh, standardization, in terms of transparency, in terms of um, rigidness or comparison availability of com to compare programs. So more from that perspective, it might be that we have learned something from the aid delivered. Um, but that's it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a one single, uh, how do you say, one direction type of, um, of knowledge or services that has been delivered. So you touch on something, Aryan, when you say one directional, right? And when we say the term decolonization of monitoring and evaluation, it suggests that current monitoring evaluation practices are colonized. Do you believe this? This is for all members of the panel. Do you believe that our current monitoring and evaluation practices are colonized? If yes, why do you believe this? Yes, Jukta, I saw your hand. So um, I think yes, and I want to go a little bit back to the previous question. I think our sector, there is there is nothing good about colonization, to be clear. I'm speaking in the language of my colonizer, and that's maybe the only decent thing that they gave my country is annoyingly one language that unites us. We have people dialing in from a place where I don't speak their language and they don't speak mine. So the only thing that's that's left behind is good. Um, as Aryan said, the only decent thing that I think is is it's created a world in which we feel this responsibility to protect each other. Um, but I think that is the way in which it has been colonized, is that it's given one group of people this belief that they have um, something aspirational that everyone should want to get to, and that it's their responsibility to bring everyone along with them to this state. Um, and that is a fundamental mis bad assumption that there's not necessarily one state of being, one country, one kind of quality of life that's that everyone should be clamoring to get to. Um, and I think that's the way, fundamental way in which it's been colonized, to simplify. Thanks. Yes, Noor? Yes, um, I would like to answer the one uh, that you asked the second question and about whether the current malpractices actually are uh, in the colonial setting. I would say um, mostly yes, but not, not, uh, not everything. Um, I think we are kind of going towards the direction where we also trying to, um, uh, using what Ariane has mentioned, trying to move away from the one direction we try to make it much more bottom-up approach. Of course, it's not easy knowing that all the standard, all the indicators, all the design was probably or are still probably designed in the, in the, in Europe, in, in the US, you know, in, in, the, in the Northern uh, region. 
So that's um, to, to give a much more participatory sphere, participatory approach, and also bottom up, not only just a, a tokenism, but a real meaningful uh, participatory process that has been started. The type of the, the way um, uh, monitoring tool um, using not only just a quantitative, not only just traditional qualitative have been already started as well, but it's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done. So my answer is yes and no. If I may add, I think that um, if you ask me if it's colonized or if we need to decolonize, I think in the end is that we want to have good monitoring and evaluation practices. And so we are talking about the profession. And I think the profession so far has been dominated by some people. And I do believe that we are, if we are able to have also people from other areas than the area where I'm coming from being involved in developing this monitoring and evaluation practices, uh, then it will be a far more balanced, far more better uh, profession and better results, therefore. So I think it's, for me, it's not, of course, it's it's because of the colonization period, but I think we it would be helpful maybe just to think about how can we improve our professional practice and therefore we need all people of the world. Thank you so very much. And I like in your responses that you focus on how to decolonize. So if I heard everyone well, you believe, yes, there's colonization in terms of standardized indicators. And nor you give suggestions on how we can decolonize. So someone listening, what are some of the practical ways? Because if if I have, if I can't, if I don't use these standard indicators, what am I going to replace them with for someone who's thinking, well, there's a reason we, we use the OECD DAC criteria of efficiency, impact, effectiveness, coherence, and so forth. Is it that you're saying we do away with them? And if yes, what do we replace them with? Yes, Shinjukta. So I think... The reason that we use the OECD DAC criteria is because Western Europe colonized and took the power, and that's why they centered the OECD as a center of the universe. So the way for me, the way forwards for me and to decolonize is to do away with the central system. There is no one framework of measuring our work, of planning projects, of doing um, social impact looks so different in different places. And so for me, the way forwards is localization, um, I focus on participatory and intersectional approaches. So whatever is locally relevant and contextually relevant. So you have people that come from the countries who have uh, the ability and the power, who are given the power to design projects that are relevant for their communities um, and that will help them make sustainable change that is needed for the country. Because what is happening right now is that projects are designed and then following that, a MEL system is designed to you know um, follow that that matches Western donors or quite frankly, white people's needs of what they want, what they think would work in India, Kenya, whatever. Um, and that's fundamentally uh, changed. So it involves a shift of power for foundations and donors, for example, to uh, work with intermediaries, for example, as a practical solution to say, um, you know, to give a large unrestricted grant to an organization that says, why don't you, we trust you to find grassroots groups that are doing the right work in these specific geographies, enjoy. Um, and the reporting is light touch because we trust you and we want to just give the power back to groups that come from these specific countries. Um, and it involves also people reorienting and saying, um, let's look at a 10 year project um, that you think is going to meet the community's needs and you figure out what research looks like. Because to go back to the original question, the problem of science and social science is that it was designed here where I live in Western Europe, or, you know, here. So what is considered rigor and research and, and science is not applicable everywhere. So it involves you needing to acknowledge that and to step back and say, all right, well, why don't you tell us what works for you? Um, yeah. If, if I uh, <clears throat> may add, I think there are two, two things pops up in my mind. First is indeed the mind shift that needs to be taken place in terms of which knowledge counts. Um, so 
Um, I think in the past, most of people from my area are uh, were in the the setting that we have to deliver answers. And people from I I, I speak a bit in a kind of uh, black and white language, but that people at the receiving end were waiting for answers. And um, I think if we can just come to the table without any notions of predefined answers and just have a dialogue on what is needed and what is, what is in this situation, it will be helpful. So without any pre-notions, just sit together and listen to each other. That's the first one. And the second one is, what is the objective of good monitoring and evaluation? Who do we, who do we serve? And I think the people we serve uh, in the past monitoring and evaluation type of work, it was mostly the donors because they were paying or they were having set the criteria and the indicators in the project documents. But in the end, we are there to serve the communities or the stakeholders in whatever context. So if you say about how which steps to be taken, I think we have to start there. How can we involve communities within the m and practices? If I can add as well here, and I think what is also something important when we talk uh, to, to um to move uh, to what Sang Yukta and also Aryan suggested on how to decolonize MEL, the current practice of MEL. What is also very, very crucial to be done is the capacity building. Of course, we do trust that that, um, that there is also uh, the local um, contextual uh, wisdom capacity that have been um, uh, established or owned um, um, in the other part of the world where not in a westernized uh, center. But this is also something that we also need to admit that there is a huge gap. There is lots of gap. It's because all the resources of the development work, just like this, the webinar, we can access this if we have internet access. If we don't have internet access, we can access this kind of knowledge or or, or updates what happen in the world about male uh, practices, etc. So the capacity building is very crucial to be really um, highlighted and addressed in terms of how to make it much more contextualized, not putting our own standard, the Western standard, but also using the language that and also culturally sensitive that, that fits and, and match with, with the needs of the, what Arian mentioned, the community that, that uh, work there or that, that we try to um, uh, uh, meet the needs um, of, of these this groups. Talking about disabled group, you know, that, that they can have, they have a special needs that is, is something that also we, all, we, we always or often forget. Um, even sometimes myself, I have to be very aware when I talk not too fast, you know, uh, uh, just be respect with other needs of people that, that work with me. This is something that is not automatic in our in our thinking yet. So all of these are, are still to be built even for us among us, the male practitioners. Uh, I think that um, speaking also, I've been a team leader <clears throat> for some projects uh, for different donors, EU, USAID, and also Dutch donors. And in most projects, um, when I was responsible for monitoring evaluation, it felt like that we had a monitoring evaluation type of work and we have the project work. So they were separated. It didn't, I, I didn't feel that the monitoring evaluation system was really helping the people we were, we are serving or helping me to have better results. So that's, I think, what we need to do is to start with the actual results that we want to achieve um, and then see how monitoring evaluation can be relevant for that. And now sometimes I felt it was the other way around, that we need the project to serve the monitoring evaluation system. Very interesting insights. And if I'm to summarize everything that I've heard, uh, so far is that you're saying a decolonized approach is one that is inclusive. It's one that is bottom up. It's one that listens to the community, the people that we serve, which include persons who have a disability. It goes in the way we frame our indicators. So to make indicators context and culturally sensitive and specific and not just to rely on external indicators of success, right? But 
let me bring it a bit personal now to my panelists. Could you share a moment in your career when it hits you? Because like me, I'm just going around doing my daily work, to be honest. I don't sit and think on these philosophical questions. Oh, money needs to be decolonized. Could you give me a moment in your profession when it hits you? I think Aryan touched on this, but when it hits you personally that, oh my word, we need to decolonize the approach to m and &E. So a, a really specific experience of yours that you're like, nah, uh, 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 uh. This, is, this is too much. I have one to share. I'll share mine after, but the floor is open. So, uh, yeah, I I started my career in nonprofits working at Open Society Foundations where I was working on, on anti-discrimination work. Um, and I didn't realize, I went in naively thinking that, you know, there's good intentions behind all of this, but it didn't hit, it, it, when, when I got there, the amount of white saviorism in that context was astounding. And the assumption that a, a philanthropy, a Western white philanthropy would know what Roma people in Central Eastern Europe and Western Balkans needed. Um, and that level of condescension and patronizing approach um, also inflating their own role because donors don't really understand that they are just a checkbook. Um, and this thing of we're change makers, no, you're not. You're sitting in an air conditioned office somewhere else. You're not, you're nothing. But, I mean, you're, you're the financial support and that's it. So that's when I realized and I didn't have a word for it because I mean, India decolonized literally less than a hundred years ago. So if I didn't use that word and I think it's still a very grand word for something that's not throwing away a violent oppressor. But that's when I realized that something needs to shift in power and the way in which we look at our sector. Uh, and that's, uh, so I started doing the work before I, before I had a word for it. I was calling it like double discrimination before I knew it was called intersectionality, for example. Um, so yeah, that's when it really, yeah. White saviorism, it'll do it to you. Yeah. Um, when it hits me, it was already, um, I think it was in 2000. Seven or two thousand eight, I was working on a <clears throat> on a project in Vietnam, and it was about linking education to the private sector. And um, we had some very good uh, private sector people who were very happy about the results of the project. They had nice. They had um written down not written down but we had some nice interviews with them some narratives and then an external evaluator came and just just uh, how do you say that uh, didn't acknowledge that this was to be incorporated because it was just an interview or just a, a story which was not based on scientific type of questioning or scientific type of uh, working. Uh, so all those narratives from private sector people who were really enthusiastic about the results that the project has, has delivered um, was not taken into consideration. And then you just, I was, um, um, how would we say, shocked by, because even if it's not fitting the uh, the standardized way of monitoring evaluation practice at that, at that moment. You just ignore the relevance of people. You just ignore what people are saying. You just don't are respectful for people who are engaged and who are just just as um, valuable as any other people. So then it hits me. Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, that's that's very uh, very uh, um, yeah moving. Uh, experiences I also have it myself I think what hit me was um, um, I'm talking about now um, the use of, of a story-based uh, approach that that I um, you already mentioned that uh, and the most significant change it was in in a year of 2000 let me think 2000 maybe 13 14 we got an assignment of um, um, to integrate this uh, which is a very good um, 
um, just not not a just a very good initiative i would say from the donor to integrate the most significant chains because they do believe that this can also reach uh, um, increase the, the richness of the of the mail that they have in a program in a livelihood in a coastal area in indonesia in eastern part of indonesia so um, we got this and um, we went there and then we started talking with with women who um, are um, uh, illiterate uh, this is this is really like like the uh, program participants uh, that that um, they said well it's very difficult for us uh, to use the uh, conventional way of uh, many data collection and the way we are doing now to make them really engaging uh, uh, meaningfully in this mail uh, system that we have that's from the program that that um, uh, we built the capacity on to to uh, integrate or to implement this MSC and then um, when we had an opportunity I had an opportunity to talk to this um, to this uh, woman which really moved me a lot as well she said yeah um, I was always wanted to participate in the meeting, in the in the uh, program uh, gathering, etc. That that was uh, or that are conducted in my village. But what really uh, um, uh, make me on uh, the barrier for me is that because I'm I'm really ashamed that I cannot read and write, and that's because you know I have to sign this uh, attendance or whatever. Um, uh, this this like you know then we can get this extra. Um, transport money, etc. Uh, so because you have approval of that. So when we try to use and compare the use of this um, interview KAI, regular way of KAI, and then I try to use this MSC and just making an open conversation with her. And what happened was this woman has really moved me that she, she really um, uh, expressed um, what has changed in her life because of this program, just by telling me a story. Nothing that I asked about indicators, nothing. Mm -hmm. I didn't really ask one by one, question by question that I have in, in on my hand um, on this, you know, um, you know what, what this KAI guideline, whatever. I just let it go and I listen to her and I just respond when I need. And at some point she also, um, very gratefully and and tears came down the whole of this you know all of this that was a discussion a conversation that lasts almost two hours but she was very happy she was really happy to be able to tell me a story and at that moment i thought oh wow how powerful it is and when i brought this to the program to the program staff it's like have you ever talked this way have you ever used have you ever got this data the way that uh, we we collect the data through the storytelling um can be msc or anything and they said no we never had this data so this is something that is not captured in our toc this is nothing that is not captured in our uh, indicator base so that's what how i see mm -hmm. that yeah, this is very powerful, but we this just because, as what you said, the design of the program was made not on that village, not in that village, mm -hmm. but was in a very AC nice office somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Europe, maybe in Jakarta, maybe in the US, I don't know. But they was not involved. There were no involvement um, of this, this, this women, this group of women who actually are really... <clears throat> In and out day to day knows about the program and and participate uh, participatory uh, and participate in this in a very meaningful way. So that was really hit me a lot, and that's um, made me more committed even to use more participatory technique in mail. Okay, thank you, Noor. Thank you, Sunyukta and Aryan for sharing your stories. My story is happened many years ago when I just moved to Europe. And I was working with a Dutch civil society organization that shall remain nameless. And we were working on, I think it was a questionnaire. And in the demographic section, in the group, I said, okay, let's, let's have a question asking on ethnicity or, and background, right? Because the only thing they had there was, um, male, female, because of course they knew we had to have something in there on gender. So I say, but what about ethnicity? Ethnicity. And my colleagues, all Dutch, sorry, Ariane at the time looked at me and like, hell no, mm -hmm. because um, 
in Dutch society, we, we don't ask person their ethnicity. We don't collect data on that. That is discrimination. Yeah. And, I, and I said, look at it from a different perspective. If you don't collect data on how the program is serving persons from a certain background, how will you know if their, their, their lives are being changed? How would you know if you're not even collecting data? Because coming from the Jamaican context, it, 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 is, it is, and not to say that any context is better than the other, but we collect data that's just more than male or female or so forth because yeah. we want to know how our program is reaching the different areas. And that was the first time it hit me because I was shut down. Shut down, right? You know, all of them in the room just pounce on me. Ah, you're, you're not from Holland. You're not from the Netherlands. You're coming with your Jamaica. No, this is how we do it here. Okay. And none of the indicators were disaggregated. Only male, female. That's it. Forget about disability. Forget about ethnicity. And I was even there in the room lobbying. And I'm like, I'm a black woman. I don't feel it's discrimination if this survey has... A category that state my background, my immigrant status, or so forth. I don't feel discriminated. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't feel but and th these were all white people telling me this. Yeah, you don't feel, but we are telling you it is discrimination, so we're not going to put it there. So that was the first time I was like, wow, if I'm sharing my thoughts and you're telling me how I should feel and how I should interpret it, and you're not going to disaggregate the data, but more than a decade ago, I didn't call it decolonization. I, mm -hmm. I didn't even pick in my mind. I just say, okay, well, I'm new and I'm not from here. So I leave it and keep it going. But I did feel that my voice wasn't heard in that there wasn't even dialogue to hear me out like, why do you think this? What is your rationale for wanting the data disaggregated? So anyway, that was my first time that I said, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Something has to change. Looking at the time now, I see we're at um, 35 minutes in. So I'm going to now open the floor for questions from the audience to our panel. So, Zhao, yes, yes, Shunjuta, before we move on. Sorry, I just, I've been following the chat and there's been such interesting conversations going and thank you everyone for your contributions. And after this, you know, I'm, I'm taking screenshots because there's so much there that I want to really unpack. Uh, and I don't know how to save it because I'm, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but if anyone has any further questions after this, you know, please, you know, email us or write to us on LinkedIn or whatever. But one thing that I constantly noticed was people are asking for tools and approaches. And so I wanted to quickly just respond to that. I think, in decolonizing, what we're working with is going away from a system where there's only one way to do something or one framework or the log frame is the only way that you can measure. So I'm hesitant to say this is an approach to do. However, as others have mentioned, participatory rural appraisal, PRA, uh, participatory learning and action, PLA, FPAR, which is feminist participatory action research, action research more broadly, the tools that Noor is a specialist in, MSc, storytelling, case studies. There are specific things that you can um, start using. And uh, not, I mean, I'm going to, but I, I blog about this a lot. There is no one specific way to do it. But if um, on my website, there are like tools, templates, guidelines, things that you can start using. But just to say, it's try a bunch of things. It's that it's, there won't be one approach that fits uh, in any project or country or whatever, but you can try opening up Someone mentioned that it's participatory takes time and a lot of money. Yes, it does. However, there are ways in which you can open up the ways you do surveys online. You can still use Typeform. I'm a remote M&E consultant and I do uh, decolonized approaches sitting in my home office in Spain. Uh, online, there are methodologies and ways in which you can design it separately. But there's no there's no like framework. Try this plug and play and it's going to be perfect. Um, and I will also say that there's a an amazing organization in India called Praxis. They have an office in the UK as well. They have annual workshops where they teach participatory approaches. Um, not to say that India is amazing, but it is. And there's a lot of really pioneering work done by amazing Indian researchers in PRA and PLA. Um, and I can, you know, write the names of a few researchers there. But just to say there's no, there's no one resource. Just try a bunch of things. 
Thank you, Sunyukta, for giving practical tips on how persons can decolonize, monitor evaluation. Nor and Aryan, are there any other practical tips apart from storytelling techniques, most significant change? Uh, what I, I wanted to add is, um, I think indeed uh, um, you were right. Uh, it's not that there's, I think, of course, we have tools and we have uh, products available which, which can be helpful already, but I also think that still we need to develop it together. And I think that uh, there are some interesting uh, uh, networks, for instance, in Africa where I work. Um, you have, I will put it in the chat, but you have young modern evaluation networks of young ME professionals who are trying to. Uh, network with each other to develop their own uh, tools and practices based on their um, common challenges. So I think there are some very nice examples of networks, South to South networks, specifically also in Africa, where this young generation of new M&E professionals are coming up and they will come up with their own solutions. I have no doubt. I will put it in the chat. Thank you, Arian. And do you can you share a successful case study where the ME process was effectively decolonized? I will put it in the chat. Is that in okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And yes, Noor. Yes. No, I'm I'm also scrolling up and down. Um, I, it's really interesting to see how the comments and also uh, input. Um, I agree with you. I think several mentioned, I think even the word that we use, that I use, bottom up, it should be changed with a participatory more, more, you know, that is, that's not showing uh, what, who is the, who are on the tops or who are at the bottom layers. So uh, that's, that's, I think from the wording, we, we also still have to learn a lot because some of the wording are indeed indicate still a colonizing approach in a way. Um, some of the methods, I would, I would go to that. I think uh, there are also uh, a lot of, um, uh, happening at the moment, the use of visualization um, as well in the monitoring and evaluation. Um, uh, of course, um, there, there are always uh, some limitation um, uh, to certain uh, approach and we have to be aware of that and we admit that. And so meaning admitting it, meaning that we also then know how to address them. Um, like the use of photo voice, participatory video, um, and the digital storytelling. All of these um, uh, usually are much more engaging, especially when we talk with the young people, for example. But then again, we have to see um, the internet literacy, um, the access to internet um, literacy in general, etc. Um, what is also important is, um, um, I think now the practice of the use of mixed methods, it doesn't, it, I, I don't say, or um, it should not be said that, you know, we have to go full blast on qualitative. We still need also quanti quantitative approach because sometimes um, there are also data that cannot be 100% um, uh, captured with the qualitative approach. So the mixed method it, is still important. It's just we need to know on how to capture that uh, in a contextualized um, way, uh, in a way that that you know the um, the, the the localities can can um, can adapt it, for example, um, with the with the capacity that that that, that, that they have. Um, and it is still showing the accountability aspect as well, because that's what is important for the donor, as we cannot really also get away from that. And also I see on the on the chat as well how to how to um, uh, convince and um, the donor, the funders, um, that you know this this the importance of the of the participatory method or or this this participatory approach in the mail in the mail uh, um, in uh, in uh, um, in doing the mail. I think um, that's that's um, is our all our responsibility. We can start it from ourselves. For example, if if I'm a consultant. Uh, with my with my company, the way I will do that is basically when we do or, or receive an assignment, we can try to negotiate with our client and and put that on the table. Hey, look, you know, we know that you won't do you want us to do this, but what about this? There are more advantages if we do this, etc. So the dialogue between the consultant and the client, we can start from a small scale, I would say, and hoping if everyone um, on the consultant and um, uh, can do that, that that's becoming a collective awareness in the end. 
And also we have like Peregrine, um, a platform where we can also have a talk and the donors are there. I know it's not easy, but I think now more and more, uh, even like, for example, the, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they're also much more open to, to this kind of uh, innovative participatory. I'm sure also other other um, um, uh, funders as well uh, in other countries. So I think that that can, can be started from us, um, in my opinion. Thanks, Anne. Yes, thank you so very much. This is a nice transition to our poll. So we have heard about some of the challenges in decolonizing, monitoring, evaluation, and learning practices. So I have a poll for you, and I'm going to share the link for you to participate in this poll. Go. The QR code is here, and the code that you can enter once you go to minty.com you use this code to answer the question, what is the biggest barrier you see to decolonizing m and &E practice? All right, so while the poll is going, it, it seems moving from compliance to learning is seen as the biggest challenge. I, Members of the panel, is this surprising? Do you want to give any comments based on the feedback you're seeing here? No, it's not surprising to me. In, in fact, uh, in during my last projects, um, where I was a team leader, we did not have monitoring evaluation professionals, but MEL professionals. So specifically focusing on the elf of learning. And I do think that's what I tried to say in the beginning of my uh, contribution, that indeed um, we should focus on the learning within our work and that monitoring are really uh, involved in those projects. I agree. Okay, thank you. I will also say, though, I think the biggest barrier to actually implementing it, because there's so much that we know and we understand what the problems are and the challenges are, but I think putting things in place does involve buy-in from leadership. That's what I um, voted for in there. I think it involves the power holders, decision makers, understanding and committing to it as well, and to actually... Because otherwise, we have a bunch of people like us who, unless you're an independent consultant like me, I mean, I, I have the power to implement it myself. But, if, uh, you know, it winds up being something that you need to target donors, senior management in, in international organizations, um, have these conversations in the philanthropy space. So I think that's also important to actually start, start somewhere. Um, because we don't need to have the tools perfected. We can just begin by doing something or having conversations. Um, otherwise, it just becomes conversations and we get frustrated because we all see the need to do something, but until the power holders actually start committing to it, we, nothing will actually happen. Yeah, I think that's uh, what I, uh, to add on that, I think there is a need for safe spaces uh, within um, our work in, wherein we can, on equal footing, just dialogue with each other and also a space where we can reflect on our own performances and can really can also engage in personal gr personal growth but i think these safe spaces which i call them are important and therefore we need leadership indeed to create those spaces and to create time to have those discussions about hey how are we doing how are you feeling um, and we mostly forget because we're all focusing on projects to deliver deliverables, and then we forget that we are all people, and people we need uh, people needs attention, and therefore these spaces where we can also uh, oppress the oppressor uh, needs to be there. Maybe something I would like to add uh, on the notes of my colleagues uh, that have been mentioned here is also the importance of allocating sufficient budget for capacity building from the donors. Yes. Um, the last um, um, assignment that we did, um, uh, which is also um, um, commit on or preaching and the leading from the South. But what, what we forget or what they forget sometimes is that, yes, we want to do that, but where are the budget for it? There is no budget allocation for that. So it is, it is in theory, it's, it's good, but in practice, it's so difficult to be done. It's just because all the, don't even talk about the capacity building budget for the mail. For the mail itself, the budget is probably not maximum than 3% in total. Uh, we're lucky if we can get 3%. Um, 
because the program is just big and, and it's multi-countries, etc. So in this case, I think it's also a, a reminder for, for and that's, that's uh, important also to open the dialogue and, and um, from us, from the consultant, we also need to to be uh, very transparent. That hey, look, if we want, if we if we want to do this, um, um, you know, uh, transferring or learning to to address the learning um, uh, component to provide the safe space for learning, we do need sufficient budget for that, and that's something that that uh, that that is a must. It's a must requirement, and 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 it is often neglected. So that's also something that time and and money um, that is very important as well for moving to the decolonizing um, in Mel. Thank you so much. So we need money, we need <laughs> time, and we need to create a brave space. Thank you so much, everyone. This brings us almost to the end, right? Thank you for contributing, for your time today. And I'm happy that we got to touch on practical solutions. The chat was on fire. The links are there. So to end positively with next steps, you have the means to decolonize. And we're ending with a nice video of what you can do in your process for decolonization. And that's about telling the story and inclusion. So that's the last thing you'll see from our side is this video. So I'll take the chance to thank our guests. Thank you, Zhao. Thanks, everyone. And let's stay in touch. Okay. Stick around. Thanks a lot, everybody. Doctors Without Borders. What do you see? Do you picture someone who looks like me? Helping someone who looks like me. This is a fundraising poster MSF Norway used in 2006. And we've been using pictures like this for a long time, including pictures of me. The problem is, we haven't always given you the whole picture. The full picture. Here, we even cropped out the parents of the boy. Whose name is Ali Hamad. He's a real person. So that he looks even more alone and helpless. For years, we've used pictures like this. To raise awareness. To raise money. To recruit staff. But today, we recognize that these images propagate a single story and perpetuate racist, racist stereotypes, stereotypes of so-called white saviors and powerless victims. But Doctors Without Borders has always been Nigerian Without Borders, Kenyans Without Borders, Filipinos Without Borders, I say San Francisco, Mexicanas Sin Fronteras, we just haven't focused on them as much as we should have. So, you might not know that of all our colleagues around the world, the largest number are from South Sudan. You might not know that this is because four out of five of our colleagues are hired locally in the countries where we work. You might not know that today more than half of our international mobile staff, of which I am one, come from Africa, the Middle East, Asia and Latin America. You might not know that Doctors Without Borders has so much diversity because we haven't always shown that to you. And that is because our humanitarian history is unavoidably rooted in the history of colonialism and neocolonialism and its stubborn stereotypes of the white European expert and the distant order in need. So now we've begun the long journey to change MSF culture and way of communicating and advocating. And because we all have blind spots, we will certainly stumble along the way. But this isn't just about getting it done. It's about getting it right. Some changes should be easier than others. Like showing a more representative picture of who we really are, where we are coming from. When we tell our story. Our whole story. Of course, that story still includes people who look like me. Because that is still true. However, white people shouldn't be the center of every story. Because that is not the whole story. And that's why we want to pass the mic to our colleagues around the world much more often. So that more people from our diverse workforce and the patients themselves can tell their own story with their own voice from their own perspectives and co-own the story. This is important. So now it's uh, also up to you. Will you listen to them? We hope you do. Some say that fewer people will listen when the story isn't told by someone who looks like me. They say that this kind of poster won't raise as much money. 
and that means we will save fewer lives. Will, will you join, join us, us in improving, improving them, them wrong? wrong? We want to believe you will. Because this is not about us and them. It is not about heroes and victims. This is about global solidarity and humanitarian justice. Because we, we are, are all just, just human, human beings. beings with the same worth and dignity and, and the, the same, same right, right to, to live, live in safety, safety and health.